natural units are the results of asking yourself questions like, I keep writing down all these M's and K's and L's. I know they're there. Do I really have to keep writing them? And of course, you all know from long experience that if you stop writing them and just put them back in at the end, you're probably going to make mistakes. So natural units has the same problem that you can get stuff wrong. But it's really an extension of something that we often do anyway. Now, I suspect those of you in solid state physics, I don't know this, but I suspect when you have numbers for energies, you use electron volts and not joules. And if you ever talk about lengths, you use nanometers, maybe angstroms, probably nanometers, and not meters. Because those are units better suited to the problem at hand than um, meters and joules would be. It's the same thing that we don't measure distances between cities in millimeters, but we also don't measure our height in kilometers. You could, they're length units, why not? Just do it. But we tend to choose units, and, and what's the criterion? Well, it's usually not explicitly stated, but the criterion is we try to use units so that we don't have to carry around lots of times 10 to the big number around. So an, uh, an electron volt is, if I remember, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th joules. If you were measuring um, energy gaps in solid state system in joules, you would have all these 10 to the minus 19s all over the place, and it would just be painful. Um, so you're using, you just pick a unit that's better suited to what you do. Um, I just want, I'll show you a quick example that I know I have done this with all of you in computational. Um, I don't remember, but I'm pretty sure two years ago when I did computational, for some of you I've done this before. But when we're working in the solar system, I will often say, okay, let's use units of solar masses for mass, years for time, and astronomical units for length. So the astronomical unit is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. The year is the period of the Earth's orbit, and the solar mass is the mass of the thing holding the Earth in orbit. So these are units well-tuned to the system at hand, and they just sort of make more sense, or at least they're easier to work with until you want to convert to real units. Real units. <laughs> no judgment implied there. Um, they're easier to work with. Just the numbers are nicer. All right, so in the case of gravitation in our solar system, how do you do this? Well, really, at some level, you just do it, right? But there is one thing that you have to consider in that we have this constant big G that you don't have the freedom to choose what it is um, because it is what it is in our universe, right? And you know, if you look it up, it's 6.674 times 10 to the minus 11th meters cubed per kilogram second squared. But now we want to have that in the units we're using. So how do I figure out what it is? There's actually a, a trickier way that gives you a much more precise answer, but I'm going to do it the straightforward way first. Well, first of all, we want to convert to astronomical units. So I'm going to have to divide out the meters cubed. So I'm going to have to put in a factor of one astronomical unit, and then it's one point, I think it's 1.495 times 10 to the 11th. Let me look that up really quickly. Is uh, 1.496 times 10 to the minus 11th. That was close. 496 times 10 to the, did I say minus? I meant 10 to the plus 11th meters. They have to cube it because there's three of those. Next, I need to get rid of the kilograms. So um, I have, I'll need to have some number of kilograms on the top. I will have the solar mass on the bottom. What is the solar mass? 1.99 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. But let me get one more digit on that. 1.989. So I only had it memorized to three digits. I want four. 1.989 times 10 to the 30 kilograms, and that's not squared. And then finally, we need seconds. And then, um, if I remember correctly, um, so we're going to have to cancel seconds on the top. We need seconds on the top to cancel it. We're going to end up with years on the bottom. I think it is, oh, you know what? I, go away. 3.16 times 10 to the 7. I usually remember it as pi times 10 to the 7, but I think it's 3.16. And this one you can actually work out by doing um, 365.24. You'd think 365.25 because we have a leap year every four years, but sometimes we don't have a leap year. So I think it's 365.24 days in a year times 24 hours in a day times 60 minutes in an hour times 60 seconds in a minute, and you get 3.1557 times 10 to the 6. So I'm going to go ahead and put this in as 3.156 just so we have an extra digit there. So it's 3.156 times 10 to the 7th 
seconds per year and we have to square it. So we cancel out the seconds squared. So now it's just a matter of putting all these numbers in your calculator and not typing them wrong, which is kind of a challenge, but I'll do my best. And I get 39.5. And now I'm going to only keep three sig figs here because I had four sig figs on the, all the things going in. So you think, oh, don't you have four sig figs in the answer? Well, I do. Uh, but notice here that this was started at one point something and now I'm at four point something. I'm just gonna, I'm going to stop here. It's good enough for what I need. And now I have astronomical units cubed per solar mass year squared. Now, go ahead and multiply pi squared by four and you will discover that pi squared times four is 39.5. There is a more clever way you can do this, thinking about the orbit of the Earth um, and gravitational forces and all that, to figure out that um, it really is 4 pi squared AU cubed per solar mass year squared. But anyway, I, if you just do the number straightforwardly, you get that. So now I can use that number for big G. Now, if you're actually a real computational gravitational physicist person, um, you don't use the number 39.5 for big G. You use one for big G. So that's really more like natural units. Now that's not exactly the same thing as what Taylor's doing, but we often will have natural units for a sort of a broad general field where we set some of the fundamental constants to one. Why? Because then you don't have to carry them around. Many of you already saw this in modern physics last year in relativity. And those of you who didn't, you will see this next year in modern physics and relativity. We set the speed of light to one. And that means um, you have your equation e equals mc squared becomes e equals m. And um, you now measure distance and time in the same units because speed becomes a dimensionless quantity. And so when I really, when you give a speed, it's the dimensionless quantity. It is the fraction of the speed of light. The easiest way to think about that is just to imagine that you're measuring distances in light seconds and time in seconds because the speed of light is one light second per second then it's not too hard to just start calling distance seconds instead of light seconds. And then what do you really mean by a distance? I mean, however far light goes in that amount of time. So you set C to one. And then if you're doing gravitational physics, you set C and G to one. Often if you're doing quantum mechanics, you'll set H bar and C to one. Although sometimes you will set H bar squared over two M to one, because that's a term that shows up in the Schrodinger equation. So that's more a natural unit sort of thing. Now, it's important to realize, how much freedom do I have to set things to one? Uh, there was a professor at uh, Caltech when I was at grad school who used to joke about Feynman units. And um, Feynman, Richard Feynman, who had been a professor at Caltech, but he died a few years before I got there. Uh, and he said Feynman units were h bar equals g equals c equals the square root of 10 equals pi equals 2 equals 1. And right, of course, that's uh, going a little too far. But if all you care about is stuff to order of magnitude, saying two equals one, eh, you're only off by a factor of two. You get it to order of magnitude. So uh, we'll often set stuff, but you only have so much freedom to set different things to one. And how much freedom do you have? Well, many of our constants, and there are some, once you get into things like electric charge, you add another unit, but we only have three different dimensions. And those three different dimensions are mass, length, and time. And so... If I set the speed of light to one, I have reduced my number of dimensions by one, right? So by insisting that the speed of light be one, I no longer have the freedom to measure length in whatever I want. I have to measure it in something that is compatible with C equals one. So if I'm measuring time in seconds, I have to measure length now in seconds also, right? And then I also have um, mass. And so by setting big G to one, and it's, it's less immediately obvious exactly how it all works out, but effectively you are measuring kilograms in something now and kilograms second squared. It may actually turn out to be you're measuring kilograms in seconds, but I would have to think about that because sometimes it's like one over the square root of seconds or something, whatever. Um, so you're measuring mass now in something. And at that point you've used up all your freedom. Um, you have a little bit of freedom by choosing your time unit to be something other than seconds. So you could choose nanoseconds or you could choose giga years, whatever, depending on the problem you have at hand um, to make your numbers nice. But you've, you've used up the freedom. You, you still have, you know, you've used up all the independent dimensions that you have. Although later you're going to see me actually set three things to one. So that's a general field case of natural units. I will show you later an example of what Taylor does where you choose a problem specific set of natural units. Um, so we will do that. Uh, now, 
Um, many of you were at Jake's capstone presentation yesterday, and you saw him talking about coupled oscillators. Surprise. Um, for example, he showed the water molecule. And so the water molecule has an oxygen with two hydrogens sticking off of it. And then the hydrogens, so you have the oxygen. I'm, I'm not making a computer animation for this deal. So you have uh, the oxygen and then the two hydrogens. And so then the hydrogens can oscillate like this, right? The bond length can change. But also the bond angle can open and close. And so you have different modes, right? You've got these two oscillations, and then you have this, there's like three different oscillations you have there. And so what he showed, he showed one of the length oscillations, and then the angle oscillation, and showed that the um, they coupled, that uh, amplitudes went back and forth between the two. All right, so do this as an exercise. First of all, really doing this and trying to work out the geometry is actually kind of a nightmare. Now, how did Jake and his code just had the vectors and dotted them and didn't really worry about it. But suppose you wanted to do a Lagrangian or something. If you think about it, um, the atom is free. Uh, if the atom is free, I'm saying it, I'm asserting. The atom is free. Woohoo! free the atoms. Um, the atom is free, uh, meaning there's no external forces on it which means that center of mass moves at a constant velocity because external forces are needed to change the center of mass velocity. So we can go into the center of mass frame where the center of mass is at rest, sort of the most natural frame to use. The oxygen is not at rest in the center of mass frame. So you're really tempted to assert that the oxygen is at rest and the two hydrogens are hanging off of it. You can't do that. It's an approximation because the oxygen has 16 times the mass of the hydrogens, but it is only an approximation. Um, and so then if you want to try and figure out what is the angle in terms of the position of the oxygen and the two hydrogens, and you're, you're measuring it all relative to the center of mass, it becomes a pretty nasty geometry problem pretty fast. So let's go ahead and make the approximation that the oxygen is at rest. Um, you could either just do this and say, all right, it's an approximation, or you could assert that you have power over reality and that you can build dark energy nails. Right. What's dark energy? It's this thing that nobody knows what it is, and so therefore we can pretend it can do anything. Dark energy is the soul. What bullshit. Um, but we're going to build dark energy nails, which are things that you can nail atoms in place with. So I'm going to nail the oxygen in place and then let the two hydrogens wiggle. Of course, this is the same thing as if I had a, um, a, a, a hockey field. What do you call those things? Ice. An ice rink. A big sheet of frictionless surface. Ice rink. And um, I put a, a pole in place and then two springs sticking off of that pole and I put hockey pucks at the end of the springs and that would be the same thing as what I'm talking about here but let's keep pretending it's water. So you fix the oxygen in place you have the two hydrogens that can vibrate and also their angle can vibrate. Go and work it out and then do what Taylor does and I'll show you I'll do this with a different thing in a little bit. I was going to do this but I did it. Do what Taylor does and you will discover that when you linearize it, which means when you go to the lowest order, so assert both um, the length wiggles and the angle wiggles are small, you do it to lowest order, the coupling completely goes away and the oscillators are all independent. They are coupled, but not to lowest order. So when you linearize, you don't see the, that coupling anymore. So this analysis with all the matrices and linear algebra stuff won't uh, reveal the coupling. So you'd have to go to higher order to actually see the coupling. It's there. It's real, but it doesn't show up to a linear term. So, um, so I'm going to have to do something a little more complicated if you actually want to see this coupling. So I decided I would go with ammonia, NH3. You've got the big nitrogen atom at the center, and you've got the three hydrogen atoms sticking off. Now, it turns out the equilibrium angle between the two bonds is 107 degrees. 360 divided by 3 is 120 degrees, and 120, I am sad to say, is not the same as 107, which means these three hydrogens, uh, the three bonds, can't all be in the same plane with nitrogen. And so the real <clears throat> equilibrium configuration is something like this, where the hydrogens hang down. Um, and now, even if you nail the nitrogen in place with one of your dark energy nails, really you have... If you want to figure out, so what are the parameters I'm going to use? Well, we have six parameters. We have the three lengths of the three bonds and then the three angles between neighboring bonds. I need to be able to write the kinetic energy and potential energy or the potential energy, not so bad, but the kinetic energy in terms of these lengths and these angles. Um, but um, if you all right, so if you start with X, Y, and Z of all the atoms and you try and do all the geometry, um, it quickly becomes very painful. Um, and then also say, how do you get rid of the three of those parameters? Well, so you're going to have to use the fact, like, for example, the three um, angles are all have to sum to something because the, 
you can figure out one of the angles from the other two, at least in principle. So that I started doing that and quickly realized this is going to be too messy and too hard to do. So instead, I decided to go with something I call flatland ammonia. Flatland is a novel written in the late 19th century by Edwin Abbott, Edward, Edwin, somebody whose name starts with E, Abbott. Um, off, you've probably read it because uh, you often, high school math teachers assign it. I assigned it as a reading when I taught general relativity back at Vanderbilt because it does two things. One, it really thinks about what would it be like to live in a two-dimensional world and then being a two-dimensional creature to encounter a three-dimensional person. And the reason I do that is because in general relativity, we have stuff that's intrinsically curved in 3D. It's sometimes you want to think about that as a 3D thing that's curved in 4D. So you have to think about 4D. How do you do that? Imagine somebody 2D thinking about 3D, which we can do because we think in 3D. It's also a parody of Victorian society. Uh, that's, the novel is also that, and, the, and we, we do it in math. We never talk about that, but of course, it's there. Anyway, so flatland ammonia, that means there are only two dimensions. So what does flatland ammonia look like? I'm going to draw. Flatland ammonia has its nitrogen at the center, and it has three hydrogens. And in equilibrium, you know, the angles between them has to be 120 degrees. In this case, right, because it is all flat. And I'm going to number my hydrogens so I can talk about them. They all have the same mass. They all have the same equilibrium length. So I'm going to write... Um, I'm going to write the position of, say, number one, or not the position, but how far is it from the nitrogen? We will call that L1. I'm going to actually write it as L0 plus R1. So R1 is not actually a radial coordinate. Um, there's some equilibrium length that's L0, and then R1 is the little extra length on top of that. You can maybe see why I'm going to do that, but if not, you will see very shortly. So I'm going to write, I'm going to write all of them like that. Next, for the angles, I'm going to define the angles. So let's suppose these guys are all a little bit offset from equilibrium. So let's suppose that that's where this hydrogen would have been at equilibrium. That's where this hydrogen would have been at equilibrium. And that's where this hydrogen would have been in equilibrium. So I'm going to call that angle theta 1. I'm going to call this angle theta 2. And I'm going to call this angle theta 3. They, don't, they look almost the same here. I tried to make theta 1 look bigger, but they don't have to be. Um, so I'm going to say the angle theta is just the offset from the equilibrium. Um, well, okay, let's think about our potential energies. I'll come to kinetic energies in a little bit, but let's start with our potential energies. First of all, for the bond lengths, you know that your potential energy um, for bond one, so I'll use B for bond and then BA for bond angles. So for bond one, because um, there's, there's three bonds, is going to be something like one-half K times... Um, L1 minus L0 squared, and now you see why I defined it the way I did, because that becomes 1 half KR1 squared. Oh, that's nice. We got rid of the L0 there. For the angle, so I'm going to say the potential energy for bond angle 1, 2. So that means I'm considering this angle here. It's going to equal 1 half K theta times, well, let's call this angle for now to give it a name alpha. Alpha minus theta naught, where theta naught in this case is 120 degrees squared. But what is alpha? That looks like a two. I want. Oh, I wish I, I wish I wasn't an idiot. Don't we all wish that? We all wish I wasn't an idiot. Okay, so here, if you think about what is alpha, well, um, let me go ahead and draw it all by itself without the other stuff here. All right. So this is theta zero. This is theta one. So theta 0 plus theta 1, and then this is theta 2. So theta 0, theta 1, theta 2. Alpha is theta 0 plus theta 1 minus theta 2, right? Because I have, um, that's theta 0 minus theta 2, because I've taken theta 2 off, and I have to add theta 1 to it. So that's going to be 1 half k theta times theta 0 plus theta 1 minus theta 2, minus theta 0, and oh look, with this definition, the theta zeros go away as well. Um, so you do that, uh, do the same thing for the others, and it's not too hard to write down the full potential energy. All right, and there you have it, the full potential energy. So hold on to this, we're going to need it later. There is the full potential energy. 
Now let's do the kinetic energy. Now, to do this, um, uh, we just need to recognize that if I use, where did that big thing come from down there? If I use, if I use L1 and theta1, those are just the polar coordinates. And now you could, if you were really careful, go ahead and write out everything in terms of um, x1 and y1, and then work it all out, and you'd get a bunch of sine squares plus cosine squares that went to 1. Oh, look, my calendar says I have to do computational physics. Uh, I am. I will soon, I promise. Um, you're going to get a whole bunch of cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1 terms in that, but you may remember we did this. We've done this before. It will work out that the kinetic energy of particle 1 is just m over 2, 1 half m, where m is the mass of a hydrogen atom, times L1 dot squared plus L1 theta 1 dot squared, right? That's the polar coordinates. This is the velocity along the radial direction. That's the velocity along the theta direction. And L1 dot, of course, is just R1 dot because L1 was L0 plus R1, but L0 is a constant. Um, and then, so, so we're good. Now, I'm going to write this out, though, because we're going to see that we're going to have problems. So M over 2 times r1 dot squared to get the variable we're really using, plus l1 is l0 plus r1 times, and that should have been l1 squared there, sorry. So that's still squared, plus theta1 dot squared. And now you will notice I'm going to have an r1 squared theta1 squared term in here. Um, and then when I go and take derivatives of stuff, I'm going to still have stuff cubed left into it. It's not going to go nicely into this linearized form that I want. So now, I mean, so this is fine. This is the kinetic energy of particle one. Just do two and three. You're good. Um, I'm going to do the small uh, angle, the small everything approximation. We're going to say that R1, R2, R3, and not necessarily in that order, theta1, theta2, theta3 are all small. And... Not only that, but the derivatives are small too. So this is not a standard notation. I'm making this up. I'm going to put a dot in parentheses to indicate maybe there's a dot there. So all six of those things are small um, relative to other things in the problem. So R has to be small relative to L0 for this to work right. And then theta has to be absolutely small just in radians for this to work right. So once those are small, you will notice that any term... So here I'm going to have an L0 squared times theta 1 dot squared. So that's already double dinky, right? But then this is double dinky. And so the smallest order term we have is double dinky. But I'm going to have a 2 L0 R1 theta 1 dot squared. That's triple dinky because it has an R and a theta squared. And then the term where you have R1 squared theta 1 dot squared is quadruple dinky. Um, so what I'm going to do now is in the small angle approximation, I'm just going to eliminate that thing right there. And that allows us to write down the full kinetic energy. And that's the kinetic energy we get, although it is worth, again, saying we are working in the small displacement case, which, by the way, that was the whole reading question about, um, is Taylor solving the general problem? He solved the general small displacement problem, the small angle or small offset problem. It wasn't the full general problem, right? Because the full general problem, like the double pendulum, goes fully nonlinear and all kinds of crazy stuff happens. So he was doing the general problem of coupled oscillators in the linear regime, which usually sometimes if it's just pure springs, you don't need the small angle approximation, but for lots of things you have to or small, angle, small, whatever approximation, but for lots of things like what we're doing here to get it down into the form where you can use these matrices in what he called the general case, you do have to make the small displacement approximation. So to come back to this. Uh, we've got these kinetic energies. Um, and now if you think about it, I've got six variables right here. They are. I've got six variables, which means my mass matrix and my K matrix are going to be a six by six matrix. And that sounds pretty extreme. But, but let's start just with the R1 equation. So I'm not going to write down L. You know that L is equal to T minus U. So if I do the R1 equation, that's going to be, well, let's just do the pieces of it. So partial L, partial R1 dot is, and if you look, it only shows up in T, it's going to be M R1 dot, right? Because the squared and the one half do their thing. So D by DT of partial L, partial R1 dot is just M R1 double dot. Hey, that was nice. And then just as easy, partial L, partial R1, there's only one place it shows up. 
Um, and that's right here in the potential energy. So we're going to get um, minus, because of course L is T minus U, that's where that minus came from, minus K R1. And what, and of course, one way to do the Euler and Raj is to set these equal to each other. I have MR1 double dot equals minus KR1. It doesn't depend on any of the other variables. So this tells me that my lengths, and if I had done this for two and three, I would get the same thing. My length oscillations in the small oscillation approximation are uncoupled from each other and from the angle oscillations, right? So what that means is that I'm going to ignore those three right now. Because, you know, look at this. That's the simple harmonic oscillator. Right? You already know what the solution to that is. You know that R1 is going to be A cosine omega T plus B sine omega T, where A and B are dependent on initial conditions, and omega is root K over M. That's the simple harmonic oscillator solution. You've done this before. So R1, R2, R3, they're all done. They are independent simple harmonic oscillators that don't link with anything else as long as we stay in the small angle approximation. So... What I'm going to do now is just sort of neglect them from my system, and I'm going to just think about the angle. So yes, the links could oscillate, but since they don't couple with anything else, um, we're not going to worry about them. Let's just look at the angles. Now, when I do this, to make sure I'm not cheating, we have to make sure that R1, R2, R3 don't show up in the angle equations, because then they would couple, um, but they won't. So let's simplify this and just do the angles. And so if you do that, this is the angle part of the Lagrangian you get, right? So I've left out all the R's. And notice there are no R's or R dots anywhere in here. So we have completely separated them out. So now we're just going to consider the angles, and they will couple, right? Because it's stuff like that. It's going to make them couple with each other. So we still do have some couple oscillators, so it's not completely boring. Now, I'm going to do the natural length unit thing. Uh, because there's all these extra constants I'm carrying around that I don't want to carry around. So I'm going to define M to be 1. Effectively, what that means is that I am working in units where mass is the mass of the hydrogen atom, which is approximately, but not exactly, 1 AMU, right? So mass is approximately equal to 1. I'm also going to define L naught equal to 1. So now I'm working in units of the bond length, which I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's a little bit more than an angstrom. And I'm going to go farther than Taylor did. I'm going to just go all the way out and define K theta is equal to 1. So, right, so what this means, so mass, and I'm going to use capital letters for the dimensionalities. The dimensionality of mass is mass. The dimensionality of uh, length is length. And the dimensionality of theta spring constant, what does that turn out to be? It turns out to be um, kilograms per second squared. Uh, is that right? Nope, it's kilogram meter squared per second squared. So that's an energy. It's a full-on energy unit. Um, now, do I really have the freedom to do this? And I didn't want to call this kilogram meters per second squared. I wanted to call it mass length squared per time squared. Do I have the freedom to do this? Well, yes. Really, what I'm doing this is I'm defining what my time unit is. What is that time unit? Ask me later. Okay, I will tell you later what that time unit is. It's going to work out to be something like something times 10 to the minus 14 second is the time unit I'm using. But, you know, I have chosen my mass unit here, my length unit here. I have I can choose one more thing, but now I'm completely and totally constrained. Um, I have to work in these units. But when I set all three of those things to one, you'll notice that the Lagrangian gets a whole lot simpler. So if you imagine setting all those things to one, the angle Lagrangian now just becomes that thing up there. So now that we have that, let's do our Euler-Lagrange equations. So for theta 1, we'll just start partial L, Lagrange, the theta Lagrangian, partial theta 1 dot is just theta 1 dot. Isn't that nice? So d by dt of partial L theta by partial theta 1 dot is now theta 1 double dot in these weirdo units where we set all that stuff to 1. And partial L by partial theta is just going to be um, minus theta 1 minus theta 2, right? Because I had the I had the squared there, so that would have been the 1 half, and then I would have had to chain rule in, and I'd just get a 1. Um, but I'm not done, because there's a theta 1 over here, too. So I also have minus theta 3 minus theta 1 times negative 1 when I chain rule in there. All right, so now I can write out the Euler-Lagrange equation, which just remember one way of writing it. 
is partial partial t, or sorry, time to full d by dt of partial l partial theta 1 dot is equal to partial l partial theta 1. And if I write that out, I will get theta 1 double dot is equal to, and I'm going to go ahead and collect these together. So I have a minus theta 1, I have a minus 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 theta 1, so it's minus 2 theta 1. And then I have a minus minus theta 2, so that's plus theta 2. And I have a minus minus theta 3, right, because this negative 1 plus theta 3. Right, and that's the theta 1 equation. Do the same exercise. It will not surprise you to learn that theta 2 double dot is equal to theta 1 minus 2 theta 2 plus theta 3. And theta 3 double dot is going to equal theta 1 plus theta 2 minus 2 theta 3. Right? That is what you will get if you do the Lagrange for theta 2 and theta 3. Leave that as an exercise for the alert reader, but looking at it, you should not be surprised. So now that I have those equations, um, now I want to work out my K and my M matrices. So what that means is I want to be able to write this equation in the form the sum over J of M I J theta double dot J is equal to minus the sum over J. And by the way, I realized that I've been using a different sign convention on the K matrices and all the lectures I've done before. I'm going to switch now to Taylor's convention of, of this negative sign here because it looks more like the spring, right? M x double dot equals minus kx looks more like the spring equation there. So we'll just use that. Kij theta j. Now, got to think about this. When you see a sum like this, notice that j is a dummy index. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that after the sum is done, j is gone. Right? So j is an internal index to the sum. And so the whole right side of the equation won't have a sub j in it after we do the sum, but it will still have a sub i. Same thing on the left. So really, this is three equations, one for i equals 1, one for i equals 2, and one for i equals 3. And there'd be more if you had more than three variables. So this way, it's a way, a succinct way of writing down three equations. So let's consider the i equals 1 case. In the i equals 1 case, and I'm just going to go ahead and anally write the whole thing out. Um, you're going to have m11 theta double dot 1 plus m12 theta double dot 2 plus m13 theta double dot 3. So that's what's on the left side. So the first term of this sum was j equals 1, the second j equals 2, the third equals j equals 3. And then on the right side, I'm going to have minus k11 theta 1 minus k12 theta 2 minus k13 theta 3. So what I did is I set i to 1, and I pulled out the equation I get from the sum for that. And so now I'll look at this equation, and you can see, oh, what do these matrix things need to be? I need m11 equal to 1, and m12 and m13 both equal to 0. And then if I look at the right side, I need k11 equal to 2, and I need k12 is equal to k13 is equal to negative 1, right? Because the, the negative sign out front. Do the same thing for this. So, so now you can figure out what all your MIJs and all your KIJs are from this equation. Um, and when you're done, you can write the whole thing as a matrix, which I'm going to erase the equations now because we're about to write them as a matrix. Go away. You could now write it in matrix form. Um, and this is a nice, succinct little matrix form of 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1 times theta 1, theta 2, theta 3 has to equal minus 2, negative 1, negative 1, negative 1, 2, negative 1, negative 1, negative 1, 2, theta 1, theta 2, theta 3. And I made an error over on the left. These should have been theta 1 double dot, theta 2 double dot, and theta 3 double dot. Right? And so then what we're going to do is we're going to write the solutions as theta i is equal to um, a alpha i e to the i omega t, where now i means two different things in the same equation, and that's a disaster. Here it's the imaginary number. Here it's an index. It's 1, 2, or 3. Okay. Um, we'll do that for all three of them, but notice that the capital A and the omega has to be the same for all three to do this. Um, and in fact, I don't even really need the capital A there, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and leave it there. Um, really what you're going to get from this is what the alphas have to be relative to each other. But I'll re 
uh, represent that by having this capital A there. Um, and so when you do that, what that does is it turns this equation here. Well, so the uh, you now can get rid of these and just turn them back into the. Um, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and turn it into alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3. I had to factor out an A times e to the i omega t to get this. And also from the double dot, I would have had a minus omega squared. And then I can do the same thing over here on the right by factoring out the stuff that's not alpha. So I'll have an alpha 1. I need to have a color to draw with. I will have an alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3. And I will have an, I'm going to write it below, but it's it's multiplied by this, a e to the i omega t on the left. Right, so then divide both sides by a e to, e to the i omega t, and you have this thing that we're used to. And now I'm going to go ahead and add the right side over onto the left side. Right, and you get this, right? And so this is the same thing that we have often written before as m. I put the omega squared in the wrong place, didn't I? No, I didn't put the omega squared in the wrong place. I just needed a negative there. And then I didn't need to know. No, the whole thing was right. I don't know. Whatever. Um, this whole thing is K minus omega squared M uh, times alpha equals zero, right? Only here, notice that M is the identity matrix. So this is already a legitimate full-on eigenvalue equation. So now we can solve this and try and figure out what are the omegas, the eigenvalues? What are the resonant frequencies that work? And then what modes go with them? And then when we're done, we're going to have to sit back and think, wait a minute, what were the units? So let's go ahead and do that. Now, you could do this by hand, but I am going to go ahead and do it full on Maxima style. So first of all, our M matrix. Oh, I want to load the eigen package and load the vect package. Um, by the way, uh, there is a semicolon here that you probably can't see because it's extremely light gray on white. There seems to be a style nowadays that's all the trend of having extremely low contrast things, and I hate it, but whatever. All right, so I have just loaded, um, you will notice I named my disks after my cats on my um, local machines. All right, I've loaded those two packages, and so I can make my M matrix because it's just the simple identity matrix. So the first row is 1, 0, 0. The second row is 0, 1, 0. And the third row is 0, 0, 1. There's my M matrix. And then my K matrix, and let me make sure I actually get my K matrix right here. It's 2, negative 1, negative 1, uh, negative 1, 2, negative 1, comma, negative 1, negative 1, 2. That's my K matrix. All right, and so now that I have that, um, I can, and in fact, since the M matrix is just the identity matrix, um, when I, I basically what I'm doing is finding the eigenvalues. And I'm going to use, um, uh, I'm going to use EIVEX now instead of UEIVEX because whatever, it actually looks nicer. Um, EIVEX of K, boom, and now we see what they are. All right, so here's what the eigenvectors are. First of all, the first omega squared is 3, and the second one is zero. And that's scary when you get a zero eigenvalue. We'll come back to that. The, here's a case where the multiplicity was not one, right? So this is the first multiplicity. So remember the way you can pull these out is eval info is eigenmess one. And now I'm going to put a dollar sign so it won't actually give me the return, uh, the the output just to keep it quiet. You can I don't know if you can see it. The con uh, contrast is too low. So eval one is going to be eval info, and then one is the eigenvalues, and that's the first one. And then eval two, and actually I do want to output that one, so I'll put a semicolon there. Eval two is eval info one, two, um, semicolon. Um, let's go ahead and get those, right? So you got three and zero as those. Now let's keep going. Multiplicity one is going to be eval info, and so then the second thing, eval info one, Two, one, that's the multiplicity of the first eigenvalue, and mult two, eval info two, two, is the multiplicity of the second eigenvalue. So you see, what that means is that there are going to be two eigenvectors for the first eigenvalue. So evec info is eigenmess two, and uh, so then, right, the way that works, it's still a list of a list of a list. Um, for, um, so evec one, I'll call it evec1a. That's the first 
eigenvector for the for first eigenvalue because this multiplicity tells us there's going to be two of them. So evec one a is um, evec info, and I have to pull out uh, from the first eigenvector, and then the first of the thing, and then I will get that list. Uh, but then I actually want to convert this into a matrix, and so let's see if I can remember exactly how to do that. I want to I want to make it a column vector transpose of um, apply matrix to evec info and uh, it didn't work because there was a semicolon extra in there. Uh, row must be list found what? So what have I done wrong? It's because matrix needs to have a list and there it is, right? So I've pulled out evec 1a and then evec 1b, I can do the same thing, cut, paste, except I want the second one, right? There I go. And then the eigenvector for the zero eigenvector, right? So remember eval2 was zero. So the eigenvector that goes with that is going to be interesting. Right, so I get the second eigenvector, and then there's just one of them, so I don't have to worry about that so much there, is 1, 1, 1. All right, so uh, we have our eigenvalues and our eigenvectors out of this. Um, and remember, the first eigenvalue was 3. And that was an omega squared, so omega was root 3. So we have an omega of root 3, an omega of 0, and then we have these eigenvectors that go with it. So now we have to try and interpret that. I will put this maxima file online. All right, so the first eigenvalue, omega squared was 3, but 3 what? Well, it's 3 of our time units, whatever they are, to the minus 2, because omega is time to the minus 1. How do I get a time to the minus 2? And so what we want to remember is our units. We had L0 was our length unit. M, the hydrogen mass, was our mass unit. And then we set K theta was ML squared over T squared. That's how the whole thing worked out. So how can I get T to the minus 2 out of that? Well... The only place time shows up, there is a formal way you can do this, but here you can actually see it faster, so I'm going to do it that way. The only place time shows up is in k theta. So if I have k theta, um, right, that will give me math, mass length squared divided by time squared. But now I need to get rid of that mass and that length squared. So if I multiply it by L0 to the minus 2, Right, that'll give me a 1 over length squared. And if I multiply it by m to the minus 1, that'll give me a 1 over mass. Those will cancel, those will cancel. I'll get what I need. So what this really says is that omega squared is equal to 3 times k theta over ml squared. And that should actually ring a bell, ml0 squared. Right, because remember root k over m, but this is an angular, and ml squared is like rotational inertia. So that tells me that omega is root 3 um, times root k over m l0 squared. Right, that's really what the omega is, and now I could put in the values of km and l0 to get actual physical numbers for them. Um, and I'm going to leave that as an exercise to the alert reader. Um, I think I told you, I don't know if I told you before, but I will tell you, and oh my goodness, um, you're going to see a thing that makes me sad. So, ooh, I didn't want that. Um, I will tell you what these values are. Um, I looked these up in Jake's charm file. Jake, if you're watching, you better be. Um, I divided it by two so that it was the standard uh, thingy. Um, so we could use k over two rather than k. Um, so we get k theta has to be 83. Um, k cal per... Uh, kilocalories per mole times angstrom squared, right? So you're going to have to convert that to something like joules per meter squared, if that's what you want. And remember what is a mole. Whenever you see mole, you can just substitute in Avogadro's number. It's one mole equals 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles, which is just a count of a number. So that's K theta. L0 is 1. Point, uh, let's see if I can do this. 014 angstroms. Right, And then M is the mass of the hydrogen atom, which I don't remember off the top of my head, but if I do, um, it is 1.0784, 0.0784 atomic mass units, 
And of course, you can do the conversion from atomic mass units um, to kilograms if you must. Uh, and you must. 1 AMU is equal to 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, right? Given all that, you could actually figure out what the number for omega is in seconds to the minus 1. And if I did it right, which I'm not convinced I did all these numbers right, um, I will get, uh, I forgot to multiply by the square root of 3, I will get 1.4 times 1.48 times 10 to the ninth seconds to the minus 1, but I'm not convinced I did the numbers right. So check this. Um, Anyway, and so that's a, you know, that's a nice fast oscillation, although it's actually not as fast as I was expecting. I was expecting closer to 10 to the 14th. That's why I'm a little worried this is wrong. All right, so the two eigenvectors that went with this were 1, 0, negative 1, and 0, 1, negative 1. And remember, what does that mean? I'm going to wipe out my units so we have something to look at here. Um, what that means is if you look at the way we had written the solutions we had theta 1 was equal to some amplitude alpha 1 e to the i omega t. And theta 2 was equal to some amplitude times alpha 2 e to the i omega t. And theta 3, and of course this capital A has to be the same for all three, right? because the eigenvalue tells you what's the ratio of the amplitudes here. So if you look at this first one, what that tells you is that Two is not oscillating, and one or th one and three are moving opposite each other. So if I try to draw that, so let's call this one. I don't know if this is the same way I did before, but it doesn't matter. One, two, three. What that means is if two is staying still, but one and three are oscillating, but they're oscillating in opposite directions, that means these guys squeeze together like this, and, um, and then they'll oscillate back out the other way. So they squeeze and spread, squeeze and spread, squeeze and spread, and then this one stays put. So that's that first motion. And then if you look at this, basically by the same thing, um, I'm going to draw it smaller because I'm running out of space. But what you get for the same 1, 2, and 3, now it's 2 and 3. But then they have the opposite sign. So that's 2 and 3 squeezing together. And um, 2 and 3 are squeezing together. And uh, number 1 is at rest. And now you should ask, wait a minute, shouldn't there be one where 3 is at rest and number one and two squeeze together. You would expect that to happen also as a normal mode, wouldn't you? And you should. You really should expect that just because there's so much symmetry here that you would, you would expect that. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to wipe out um, all that to give myself space. The um, amplitudes for that normal mode, um, if I wanted to have, right, so the final normal mode that I've expected, so I already had two at rest, and I had one at rest, I should expect to have three at rest. So that one should have an eigenvector of something like one, negative one, zero, right? Well, I want to point out that one, zero, negative one minus zero, one, negative one is equal to one, negative one, zero. This mode is actually a linear combination of these two modes, so it's not an independent mode. So yeah, that mode exists, but it's not a different mode. It's just two of these modes mixed together. And that also gets at why we ended up with um, a zero eigenvalue. Because there really are only two normal modes here. And that comes from the fact that these three angles, um, the differences between these three angles were not actually three different independent things. Because once I knew that and that, I know that this angle has to be 360 minus these two, right? And so I really only had two independent angles. And so when I thought I had three, um, that's why I ended up with an eigenvalue of zero. And now what was the mode that went with an eigenvalue of zero? It just says the amplitudes of the three are the same. But um, when you have an eigenvalue of zero, that just tells you that theta one, theta two, theta three are all a constant, right? Look at this equation here. Um, when I plug in 0 for t, e to the i omega t becomes 1. So theta 1 is a alpha 1, theta 2 is a alpha 2, theta 3 is a alpha 3. So the three thetas all are a constant, and they all have to be the same constant. And all that is is what was the starting orientation of your atom. It could be anything, right? That's all that information's in that. And so it's actually not terribly interesting. And like I say, and it's not an oscillation. 
So there really only are two, two normal modes in that case. So when you get a zero eigenvalue out, you should think about it. What does it really mean? Um, does it and you know, does that mean that I actually had fewer different independent motions than I thought I did? So that's what you get for this flatland um, ammonia. That's the kind of oscillations that you get out of this. Um, so uh, that's it for now. Um, there are homework problems that have already been posted, and you can be sure that there will be some coupled oscillators on exam three. So exam three, I will put online over the weekend. It'll be due next Thursday. Um, next week is finals week. So exam three will be due next Thursday. There will be problems related to um, rotational motion, related to accelerating reference frames, and related to coupled oscillations, because that's what we have done since exam two. However, you need to know how to be able to do Lagrangian still because you will need to use that for some of the problems. All right, guys. Have a good time. See you later.